This video is about transportation planning and forecasting. We call the rational planning model. There were a number of steps. We began, we overviewed data, we defined the problem, we formulated a goal, we examined, evaluated, and chose alternatives. We implement the alternatives and we evaluate the outcome. Well, the section in green, examine, evaluate, and choose alternatives, is what we're going to be talking about today. How do we do that? Well, we need a model. The blue box says abstract into model or framework. That's what we're going to do today. This is the transportation forecasting model. So why do we want to model transportation? Well, forecasting is an obvious reason. We want to know what will happen in the future. We also want to be able to test alternative futures. This is called scenario testing. You might say, what would happen if we had a different land use plan? or if we have a different set of networks in place, or if we implemented a different set of policies. We might use it for project planning and corridor studies, or we want to predict the amount of traffic that will be on link A as opposed to alternative B. I used it in the past for growth management and development regulation. We had adequate public facilities ordinances, and we needed to ensure that in a particular development pattern that the links on the network met a certain set of level of service standards. So if the level of service standards were satisfied, growth would be permitted. But if the level of service standards were failed, then growth would be put into a moratorium. There would be no new development in that area. But more generally, we want to manage complexity. People have different perceptions and intuitions of how particular link or particular land use is going to impact the transportation system, eyeballs are insufficient. We can't just look at it and see what will happen. The model helps us manage the complexity, makes us formally define what all of our assumptions are. It allows us to understand travel behavior. Again, the formalism is very important with the model because the computer has to be told every single thing that's going on. It doesn't make leaps of faith or leaps of intuition. Everything has to be explicitly stated. The model can help influence decisions by giving the authority of the model behind a particular alternative or another, saying this one is better and the model says so. We're providing some sort of quantitative rationale for a particular outcome. And perhaps its most useful task is to estimate in the absence of data. We only have limited data on the transportation system. We might have data on an upstream link and a downstream link, but we don't know what's going on in the middle. Some sort of model can help us figure that out. Now there's a generic model development process. The first thing we need to do is specify the model. Y is a function of X. Y is our outcome. X is our set of inputs. And we need to estimate the model. For instance, y equals mx plus b. Well, we need to know what, what is m and what is b. These are things that we can estimate with statistical methods. And we need to implement the model. This is software. So, for instance, if z is greater than w, then y equals mx plus b, otherwise something else. And then we want to calibrate the model. How well did our model match reality? How well does y predicted match y observed? Well, if y predicted is less than y observed, we might need to add some sort of adjustment factor or have some sort of multiplicative adjustment factor. We want to validate the model. Not only how did it compare in the base year, but how did it compare in some previous year? So how does y predicted in 1990 compare with the observed data for 1990? We might estimate the model based on 2010 data we want to compare it to 1990 data. If it predicts 1990 reasonably well, the model has some stability over a 20-year period. We have some confidence in its ability to predict 20 years into the future. If it doesn't predict well over the past 20 years, we should have no confidence over its ability to predict into the future. And then we need to apply the model. We have a develop a piece of software. Now, developers are typically involved in the first five steps, while practicing engineers and planners concern themselves with the application. But this is an iterative process. Each step feeds back to previous steps. Our calibration might find a flaw in the implementation, or a flaw in the estimation, or worse, a flaw in the specification of the model.
So this is an example of a simplified travel demand model that we use in class. It was called ADAM, Agent-Based Demand and Assignment Model. And you can see that there's a network here. In this case, this is the Sioux Falls network. There's a set of options to edit the network. So if we click the Edit Network button, we can adjust the, where links are. We can add nodes and links. We can adjust the capacity of links. We can adjust the land use that occurs at nodes. So we change the properties of the network. And then there's a set of global variables that affect the travel demand on the network. What is the trip production rate? What is the trip attraction rate? How many of those trips occur during the peak hour? How long are trips? Okay. How, will, how willing are people to make trips of a particular length? What is the mode share by automobile? What is the occupancy by automobile? How does congestion occur? What are the, what are the factors in the volume delay functions? What is the cost of the network? And then we press a button and the model solves this for us based on a set of underlying equations. It's roughly following the sequence of what's typically called the four-step urban transportation planning model. Now these four steps don't have to be done in exactly this order and real models are much more complicated than this. This is a conceptual framework. The first question we ask is trip generation. How many trips are entering or leaving zones? We divide the world into transportation analysis zones. For instance, the Twin Cities metropolitan area is divided into 3,000 transportation analysis zones in the most recent version of the model that the Metropolitan Council uses. So how many trips are entering or leaving each of those zones? Next step is destination choice. How many trips are going from zone I to zone J? We need to do this for all 3,000 zones. So how many trips are going from each of these 3,000 zones to every other 3,000 every one of the other 3,000 zones. Well, 3,000 times 3,000 is 9 million. So there's 9 million OD, origin destination pairs, that we're looking at. And then we might have mode choice. How many trips are going from I to J that are using mode M? Now, sometimes we solve mode choice before destination choice, and we figure out what is the probability of using mode M if you're going from I to J, and then we figure out how many trips are going from I to J. They can be done in parallel, um, the sequence isn't that important as long as you're internally consistent. But you use that information to develop what's called a trip table, which is a matrix of the number of trips going from every origin to every destination by each mode. And for each particular mode, we want to solve the route choice. So if you're using automobile, which links are you going to use when you're going from I to J by mode M? So how many are going to use route? R and how many are going to use some other route. So as a practicing engineer or planner you might have a particular problem like this. You've been asked to develop a forecast of travel demand on routes due to a new stadium. So first you need to outline a systematic method for collect conducting such a forecast including data collection and computer modeling. Then you need to explain each step of your method and its purpose. Identify the outputs of your forecast and describe how you can assess their likely accuracy. And then, how would you determine if your model is valid? So in this homework assignment, put your work results in the form of a technical memorandum. In actuality, you would have to not only specify how you're going to forecast travel demand, you would have to do the actual forecast, which requires knowing a lot more. We'll be talking about that in subsequent lectures.